This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 481, recorded on February 16th, 2018. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in New York City, Dixon de Pommier. Hey, Vincent. I'm looking at the window, and it's cloudy, 15 it's, degrees Celsius. It, it's warm. It's warm out, but it's very cloudy. We're going to get a snowstorm, That's right? That's what they said. Now, how can it snow at 15? Exactly right. That's what I was thinking, but too. It's supposed to start in like uh, an hour. I don't believe but, it. But, uh, you know, it's going to rain, because it's, it, right. it's not going to be. Although, tomorrow we have snow coming. Good Lord. Also joining us from southeastern Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Hey, Kathy. Here it's cloudy, but it's 31 degrees Fahrenheit, minus one Celsius, and there's no snow forecast for us until, well, maybe I guess they say tomorrow, but that's, I don't believe that. So last week you said you were going to get 10 inches, did you? <laughs> oh, we got eight and a half on Friday and Close. four on Saturday. Ooh, wow. And wow. you're still on the ground? Oh, yeah. No, it's mostly in the snow shovel piles, yeah. but... Uh, it's not on the sidewalks had, or street. We had a lot of rain this week, right? We did. Even this morning, it was raining. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. And it's uh, cloudy and wet and warm up here, too. It's 52 Fahrenheit, 11C. And we are also supposed to get uh, tomorrow night, I think, supposedly, we're going to get three to seven inches of snow in a rapidly moving storm. Wow. Hmm. Also, yeah. join, also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Once again, I won't, uh, well, uh, well, I will complain. Okay. It's 67 Fahrenheit, which is 19 C and there is a single cloud in the sky, but it covers the entire sky. Oh, and I'm getting sick of the gray. The dew point is 55 degrees. The relative humidity is 65%. And that will all become relevant when we get to the pics. When we get to the pics. <laughs> Let me just say it was such a nice day yesterday, as opposed to today, that I went trout fishing. Oh, good wow. for you, Dixon. And I, I caught seven nice fish yesterday. Just throw them back. Oh. I did, of course. Good. Very good. But what a privilege to go at such an early time. So I want to say why I said that I don't believe the forecast, because I checked another app, <laughs> and it says that tomorrow it's supposed to be around 40 and mm. no mm. snow. But the cool thing is it's going to be clear overnight tonight. And I thought that was really good because we heard this rumor about oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. auroras. But exactly. I wrote to the aurora expert here on campus and she wrote back and said, sorry, Kathy, it's too weak for you to see anything in Michigan. Yeah. But I'll uh, keep your phone number because she knows that she's supposed to call me even if it's the middle of the night. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was, a, there was a solar flare or a CME um, coronal mass ejection and – it kind of <laughs> glanced off Earth, but didn't really produce a whole lot of aurora. And we have a title of this episode, Coronal <laughs> Mass Ejection. <laughs> Mass right. Ejection. Ejection. Right. CME for me was hey. always the uh, Committee on Medical Education. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's know, also Continuing Medical Education. It's, like, you know, oh, yeah. It's, that's it. Continuing. One of our viruses is a coronavirus. It's perfect, yes. right? Ooh, yeah. I just like that. It sounds good. It's like elementary particles, right? Exactly. Right. In fact, that's um, what hit the earth, elementary particles. <laughs> hmm. We have a follow-up from Dylan who writes, Hello, Doctors Twiv. While listening to your most recent episode, I was reminded of an article titled Abstract I saw last year, see link below, that I don't remember you covering. I understand there are other benefits to switching the production method for the flu vaccine, but it would seem that this method could help alleviate some of the issues with egg adaptation. I must admit, I haven't thoroughly read the paper, but I would be interested in your thoughts. We are currently experiencing warming in Minneapolis with temperatures predicted to get above freezing for the second day in a row, hoping this means spring is on the way. Hmm. Thank you, Dylan. Now, he's, Dylan sent an Embio paper, rationally designed influenza virus vaccines that are antigenically stable during growth in eggs. And you remember last time we talked about, with Scott Hensley, the problem of 
losing mutations while growing in eggs that are important for matching the circulating strains, especially with the H3N2 virus. Now, the approach here is kind of interesting. They make influenza viruses with two HAs uh-huh. in them. So you could have one H3N2, I guess, and one another one. The idea being maybe maybe the H3N2 won't have enough pressure on it. To, That's a good idea. But they don't actually test that particular mutation here in this paper. They look at some other changes. They pass these viruses through eggs, and they say it doesn't change, but you know that one is the one we're interested in. So it's kind of neat. However, this is a brand new flu vaccine, which would probably take five years at <laughs> least to go through all the clinical trials you would need. Especially given that it's a goofy virus. <laughs> it's a goofy virus. That's right. Yeah. And we yeah. have we have an insect cell grown vaccine at the moment, which gets around these adaptation issues. So you do. Unfortunately, I thought, I thought the paper was cool and the concept <laughs> it is, is cool. a cool concept. Yes, very. It is a cool concept, but unfortunately, they decided to call it dual HA viruses when they they really should be ha ha viruses. Ha uh-huh. ha <laughs> viruses. Uh-huh. Yeah, if we did this paper, we could call it ha ha right. right. viruses. By the way, the uh, authors are uh, Alfred Harding, Brooke Heaton, Rebecca Dumb, and Nicholas Heaton from, where are they from? Uh, Duke. Duke. In my flippings last night. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Yes. Flipping? I'm sorry. Uh, Duke and uh, uh, this says University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. At any rate. I thought it was Duke, okay. yeah. In, in my flippings last night, I, I happened on Tony Fauci trying to explain why this year's virus out, outbreak doesn't match the vaccine. And he <laughs> he said something about this year's vaccine went into cells and then it mutated just at the wrong place. So it doesn't contain the right epitopes. And that's that's what's his explanation. Well, epitopes so, probably wasn't a good word to you. Yeah, well, I'm not sure I quoted him correctly on that one, but he said they lost – they lost the full impact of the antigenicity that it should have. Yeah, had. but he should have also said that you still should get it because it will. <laughs> oh no, he did say that. <laughs> he certainly said that. And in- yeah, and in fact, the CDC just released um, their interim update on flu vaccine effectiveness. I uh, put this on Twitter. I yeah, so probably should have put it in the show notes, but um, they found it's a thirty-five-ish percent effective against the um, uh, the tr- the strain we're having trouble with. And uh, that's a bit better than expected, but right. still. It's in older people, though. But in younger people, then, it was higher. Yes, it was like actually 69%. Bad. And then for the other strains that are in there, the B and uh, H1N1, presumably the effectiveness is also higher than 35%. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So overall, it might average higher? I think so, I mean, yes. Best part is you don't die, probably. That's the best. Well, ideally. Yeah. Ideally. I mean, just get your flu vaccine. What is the problem? Six bucks. Should we or have a free. contest to and give away? Free, should we have a contest to give away free flu vaccine? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we do have uh, some entrants in the gaming contest, by the way. Very impressed. Yes. People by the way, it was, uh, the, it's Terry Dermody. the editor on this. He's from Pittsburgh. The paper's from Duke. That's right. Dermody, yeah, we know him well. All right. We have a snippet in a paper today. And um, the paper, the snippet is a paper published in Science Advances. I'm going to start a journal called Science Remains. <laughs> retreats. And Science Retreats, two different journals. There'll be open access, no page well, charges. Science, science Retreats would be for negative results. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But you could also take this as advances as the verb or advances in science. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's another yeah. double meaning. This is this is science's um, open access yes. journal. Yes. Human intestinal tract serves as an alternative infection route for Middle East respiratory syndrome coronavirus. And this is the first two authors are Jizu three. three Jizu Kunli and Guan Yu Zhao. Now you know there's a skater called J- Joe Z H O U in the Olympics, and and oh. I, they call him Joe, Joe, hmm. Joe. Joe. Oh. I forgot his first name, um, but he, he's on the skate U.S. skating team. So should I say G Joe? I know G is a woman's name because I have, I'm on someone's committee here whose name is G J I E. Then we have Kun Li Guang Yu Zhao. The the last authors, the last two authors, let's say Sweat Yi Lung and Kwok Young Yoon. I don't know them, but I do know Christian Drosten, who's in the middle there. And these are from the University of Hong Kong, the Beijing Institute of Microbiology and Epidemiology, Al Faisal University, 
uh, the, and uh, the, the Emory University and the German Center for Infection Research, which is where Christian Berlin Boston is. Berlin. Christian According Boston. to the uh, footnotes, there are two co-contributing uh, corresponding authors, if you like, or senior authors. One is the third to last, Yuxin Zhao, and mm -hmm. right. then the last author, Kwok Yung Yun. Or Joe, depending on. Joe, <laughs> depending on whether you're a skater. <laughs> I'll get a mail saying, you don't say Joe, they're messing it up on the Olympics, which is fine. Uh, Kathy, t tell us the backstory here. Sure. So uh, just to remind everybody a little about MERS coronavirus, I guess it emerged around 2012, so five and a half years ago. Uh, and it has about a 35% fatality rate, according to the introduction of this paper. About 20% of the cases are due to direct contact with camels who shed the virus from their respiratory tract. And so it sheds from camel to human, or it spreads from camel to human by droplets, saliva, milk, or undercooked camel meat. But then how are the other 80% of cases transmitted or how, how do people get that? And so uh, if you start with, maybe you don't call this a principle of virology, but I think of it along those lines. Envelope viruses don't usually successfully infect the intestinal tract. And that's because uh, by the time you get to the intestine, there's bile salts and they dissolve the membrane or envelope, rendering the virus non-infectious. But mm. another principle of virology, if you will, is that there are always exceptions <laughs> to the rules. <laughs> that's right. And so coronaviruses are enveloped and they can cause enteric infections. And there's really good for the uh, evidence for this in animals, animal coronaviruses. And there's some kind of uh, maybe circumstantial or maybe a little better than circumstantial evidence for human coronaviruses. So even going back to the prior to 2001, there was some EM implication of enteric human coronaviruses. Uh, there was some evidence of uh, antigens, coronavirus antigens in stools when patients had diarrhea. And there was a case report in 1985 of human coronavirus uh, from an intestine of an infant with necrotizing enterocolitis. And there was also some evidence of enteric involvement with SARS coronavirus infections, but they don't discuss that in the introduction. They leave that to the discussion section. So that's, that's the background. Uh, and so what this paper purports to show is that there's intestinal tract as an alternative infection route. That's part of the title for MERS, one of these coronaviruses. Okay. So uh, they're trying to get some evidence for that. Um, well, and just to give a little more detail, the direct contact, uh, there were a whole bunch of cases in a Korean hospital right? and direct contact only accounted for about 10% of those infections. Uh, most of them were among, uh, maybe caregivers and others who were in the same hospital, but they didn't have direct contact to the MERS patients. So that kind of, again, raises the question, how, how is this? getting transmitted and maybe it's on fomites you know it, the virus it gets on inanimate objects and it's relatively stable and in fact the MERS virus is moderately more stable than you would expect for this kind of envelope virus and it's recoverable up to 48 hours after infection so what they do in this paper is use some evidence provided by another group that looked at something called protein intrinsic disorder and they categorize coronaviruses in that other paper uh, into different levels of disorder. And the MERS coronavirus, by that sorting, is in a group called C that have qu uh, what they call relatively hard inner and outer shells. Okay. <laughs> Suggesting that – and then I tried to find, you know, pictures of what do they mean really by inner and outer shells. But essentially what they're trying to argue is that there's some – property of this envelope virus that makes it resistant in the intestinal tract. And we'll see in this paper how they tested that. So, so it's, it's not a shell in the sense of a capsid. It's a, it's a shell in the sense of just a very stable enveloped structure. Right, right. Um, and so in this paper, then the, the big summary and well, why it's interesting is that maybe this is going to explain uh, some of how the coronavirus is transmitted. They Authors used intestinal cells and some tissue and organ models and some transgenic mice. 
uh, to show that the intestinal tract could be a route for getting MERS infection. Right. And they also then talk about how it could start in the, intest in the intestine and spread to the lungs, as happens for some other viruses like hepatitis A, for example. So that's, so, the, that's the background. So I guess if we had good evidence for you know, fecal transmission, we could interrupt it more effectively, right? Because right now, you know, when we're focusing on the aerosol transmission and then... Wasn't that suspected for SARS also in animals? You know, uh, people, it, for SARS, yeah. there was this thing that they, where they thought flushing toilets was involved in spreading huh. it. Do you remember that? Yeah, but I remember also... Uh, in someone, the Metropole Hotel in Hong Kong. In someone fact. was tracing SARS virus on the footprints of rats going between buildings in Guangzhou. Mm. Mm. And, well, I don't know about that, but I do know that it was associated with uh, p malfunctioning toilets that generated large aerosols. So maybe this is, you know... The, yeah. That's what's going on Sarge here. Sarge is an envelope virus as well. Yes. It's, it's envelope. It's a corona. Corona. It's, it is right. all of the corona are enveloped. They are all enveloped. Right. Ha. So let's let's actually uh, just very briefly do coronaviruses, both the genome structure and the virus structure. So it's a very long positive sense RNA, a single stranded RNA virus, uh, and it is enveloped. And I'm just here. I'm actually a little unsure about the structure. There's a nucleocapsid protein, which is a protein that coats the RNA inside the virion. There is an envelope. There's a spike protein, spike glycoprotein, that actually gives the uh, crown or corona appearance in an electron micrograph because it sticks way out. Hmm. And then I think in the paper they talk about a matrix protein, but I can't see that anywhere else. I see what they call a membrane protein. And all of the cartoons that I see have the membrane chock full of this uh, mm. membrane protein. Can you Maybe. enlighten me as to uh, the structure and function of that thing? Because that could theoretically uh, give, depending on, it, it could give the uh, particle some resilience if it's really packed in there. Yeah, I think that's what they're talking about. The M is, is tightly associated with the membrane as it is for many envelope viruses, and it, it gives support to the membrane. I mean, he, in the drawing I'm looking at, it looks like it's an integral part of the membrane. Yeah, so that right. could be that could be the second shell, right? Yeah, and the yeah, and the first one might be just the dense glycoproteins on the surface. Right. You know, if they're very densely packed, that could provide some protection to the membrane right there, right? Right. So yeah, I I tried to find a good image of it, and I just pasted in this PNAS paper that in Figure Seven has a structural model of the virion, but they still really don't talk about a matrix. Um, they talk about the M protein and so right. on, but right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of think it's a, a bit of a secret handshake among the coronavirologists, you know, what, <laughs> what's the inner shell and what's the outer shell. And cause I couldn't find any diagram mm -hmm. that had that with that kind of labeling. So. So I usually think of the matrix protein is not necessarily a matrix protein is not necessarily being an integral membrane protein right right but right, something right. that sits Below between it. a nucleocapsid and a membrane but this this looks like it is a much more integral uh it, it has the the membrane protein actually has transmembrane domains in it and also according to this pnas paper that uh, kathy just came up with uh has uh, domains that interact with the nucleocapsid protein so it's sort of uh, both a membrane protein and a matrix protein. I'm looking at uh, the picture of a coronavirus that we have in our textbook. In the book? book. And in that one, the, the matrix, um, is uh, most of it is below the, the membrane itself. Either way, this appears to, as you'll see, it appears to be quite stable for an envelope virus. And I, I always, as Kathy said, I always talk about these enteric coronaviruses of animals that can infect the GI tract. So that, you know, the, in the old days, we used to say, it's envelope, forget about the GI, but no, there are always exceptions. Um, so they, as Kathy said, they do a series of infections of human cells, human primary intestinal epithelial cells, small intestine explants from humans. Uh, Dixon, you could donate some explants if you wish. Happy to do so. <laughs> Put them in culture, infect them. You can see viral antigens in the cells. The, vir the cells produce infectious virus. They actually do plaque assays. Um, they um, they also take some of these uh, 
stool specimens from MERS patients that were previously positive for corona, uh, MERS coronavirus RNA by PCR, and they uh, do some deep sequencing on them, and they find subgenomic RNAs, which are only produced in infected cells, so those would not be found in the virus particles. So that suggests that there has been replication in these mm-hmm. in the in the intestines, right? Because these are fecal samples. Mm-hmm. They make intestinal organoids, which uh, you can produce from stem cells that are present in the human intestines. My wife said to me last night, do I have stem cells? <laughs> I said, yeah, you got lots in many different places. <laughs> we said, can I use them to fix my knee? <laughs> to restore the cartilage in my knee? <laughs> maybe not today, but maybe <laughs> someday. Yeah. Well, exactly right. someday. I would like to use them to produce better memory. <laughs> myself. So organoids you can produce from stem cells and you get these nice um, uh, structures which have lots of different types of cells uh, which are also present in the in the gut. They're three dimensional uh, structures, and in fact, we we have talked about them before. I think with Carolyn Coyne, we talked about her uh, intestinal organoids. Right. Yeah, also- and we've talked about organoids. Uh, people use them to try it in w- experimentation with norovirus. That's right. Mm-hmm. Also known as intestinoids. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, right. A, that's funny. Intestinoids. I'm suffering from and, intestinoids. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the cool thing about this is uh, when they started just with the primary intestinal epithelial cells, they only got about a one log increase in viral load. But then when they use the intestinoids, they get about a three log increase. And over time, they see an increase from 5% positive cells to 25% positive cells. Mm-hmm. Again, kind of suggesting a real productive infection. To be honest, you could use a, uh, the real intestinal cells and make it into a theory of fistula and uh, work with the real intestine. Is that what you used to do? A lot of parasitologists did yeah. that. Yeah, sure, sure. Mm. In humans? No. Okay. These well, are human intestinal organs. Under, you under, couldn't under, put viruses in. But you can, you can do experiments in people who have a fistula and you can go in and get things. There. I heard yesterday. Here they do these intestinal transplants, the whole intestinal tract, and they leave a hole so they can go in and sample the cells to see. Yeah, because there's no other way to tell rejection, but you have to go in the tissue and look at the cells, and they have an opening uh, where they go in. Mm -hmm. Uh, One side thing here, which is a reflection of my age, what happened to viral titers? Why do we have to say viral loads? (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's in the gut. About people- <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I know it's it's in the gut. Of course, <laughs> I, I, I tend to make a distinction when I'm talking about mouse organs. I talk about viral loads, but when I'm talking about yields from tissue culture, then it's to me it's yields right. and titers. Yeah. Actually, know, in, some the, of the- in the old days, Kathy, there were no loads. There was just viral titers, right? Yeah. And somehow it crept. In just like interrogating the database crept in and all these other <laughs> right. things. I didn't do it. Didn't I'm confused. Do it. Rich, what were you going to say? They right. do have virus titers here in some of the figures. They do. Not I like, know. Uh, there must be some older virologists here on the paper. That's <laughs> it anyway, the intestinoids <laughs> can be infected. Um, they, you can, they, viral loads increased by about three log units. <laughs> they can also see viral antigens in, in the cells. So they're, they're quite... They say they were highly susceptible. However, I would say they are susceptible and permissive as they complete the replication cycle. And then here's the here's the thing. You may be wondering, I know this is great that intestinal cells can be infected, but for the virus to get to them, it's got to pass it survive through the that. stomach and the in small intestine, low pH, high pH, bile salts, proteases, what else? A lot of other things in there. A bunch of bacteria. R- RNAases. A bunch of bacteria. RNAases. Nucleases, probably. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So they mix the um, <laughs> they mix the virus with fasted state simulated gastric fluid or fed state gastrointestinal fluids. And Rich Condit, what is that? Uh, you can buy these things, okay? <laughs> is it from uh, from. Uh, I looked up. It's a company called BioRelevant, hmm. uh, and you can buy these various solutions, and they are just as we s- said, solutions that contain uh, different amounts of uh, bile salts. So they're so they're made pHs. up. They're made up. They're made up. They're, right. up. they're totally you synthetic. Buy- you buy them as a powder. Yeah. Yeah. Saving you and money. You, and you, <laughs> yeah. Cool. And uh, so they've got. Uh, 
bile salts. And by the way, bile salts are things that most of them are sort of cholesterol derivatives uh, that are hydrophobic. That is, they seek out greasy stuff like membranes uh, and but have a charged component as well. So the combination of those two serves to dissolve the membranes. Mm. So they got bile salts and they got um, different pHs and you may or may not want to add some uh, enzymes and uh, fasted and fed state, they differ in the concentration of bile salts. So the fed state <laughs> has higher concentrations of, yeah. I think, higher concentrations of bile salts. Yeah. So when you eat, you get more bile salts. Right. That's right. I think they should have thrown in some Chardonnay or Cabernet. <laughs> Well, you can actually, you can take this a step further. There's a device, uh, there's at least one company that makes this no, type of device. Don't tell me it's the Vomit 2. Oh, no. oh, oh, the RoboGut. The, the Stomacher. <laughs> stomacher? Oh, the Stomacher. The, the uh, Seward in the uh, in the UK is the company, and they make the Stomacher 400 and 3500. And uh, I think this is mainly for food microbiologists. Mm. But uh, they've got on their website, they've got somebody putting the bag or either putting the bag in, which I guess would be feeding this thing or taking it out, which would be regurgitating, I suppose. And, <laughs> um, but you can it, it's got paddles on it that agitate it and it, it operates like a stomach. And I guess you could mix these juices into it and get a real stomach. Hmm. Alan, right. they use them in Europe for uh, detecting trichinella in uh, samples oh. Oh, of diaphragm oh. tissue. From around the around your because you have to digest it. That's correct. Mm, mm. So it's called the stomacher test, and then you look for the larvae in this fluid. I know that in the back in the microbial world, they do these experiments. Will though put something in a mouse stomach and clip it on either yes, end for a that's while. Right, that's right. That's and right. And then let it incubate, and then open it up. Right. Yep. Anyway, the so in, the, in this case, they're they're comparing three different uh, simulated fluids. The Fasted state gastric fluid, the fed state gastric fluid, and the fed state intestinal fluid. So mm -hmm. the fasted state gastric fluid, uh, the big difference there is it's got a low pH. It's got a pH of about 2. And that wiped the, out most of the infectivity. Right. right. The fed state gastric fluid, now maybe I have this backwards because I thought that would have more bile salts. But maybe it's adjusted in the pH because that did not trash the virus. The virus was pretty resistant to that. Yeah, I had the impression that it was only the intestinal fluid that had the bile salts added had to it. Had the elevated bile salts. Okay, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. And just to make clear that the gastric, I think, is supposed to be representing the stomach. I mean, Correct. Yeah. Yes. As opposed right. to the intestinal. Exactly. So the, the, the um, fed state. I think fluids. has a higher pH. It's a higher pH. And then that the, some virus survived in that. Infectivity yeah. survived. And the intestinal fluid, um, some also survive there, despite there being bile salts. And they it didn't use it. survive as well as some of the more yeah. classic um, intestinal viruses, but it definitely survived and looks like you could get an infectious dose through that way. Yeah, right. They, so they, they use EV71, the enteric picornavirus, yep. and right. it completely survives in that intestinal fluid Whereas the human coronavirus 229E, which is a respiratory virus, does not survive. Right. And the MERS coronavirus is in between. Yeah, so it's far from a perfect model of digesting something, but it's a really good experiment to do in these types of studies, I think. I think without that, this paper wouldn't... Without that, it's really, here. yeah, it's yeah. very speculative. And, and later, actually, too, they, they even say that they're uh, fasting gastric fluid model might have been too harsh. Um, <laughs> where, uh, yeah, I where did that. I mark that? Yeah. That might have been too harsh. Yeah. The liability of the MERS coronavirus, as shown in this in vitro assay, was probably an exaggerated result, especially when food is intake and the virus might not be exposed to such a large volume of pure gastrointestinal fluids as in this experiment. So, yeah. uh, so it can survive to a certain extent. Um. They, they also look at infection in CACO2 cells, which are intestinal cells that you can polarize to have an apical and a basal lateral domain. Um, it's a cell line. That cell line that differentiate can differentiate that, yeah. that way in culture. And you can grow them on, on membranes, and the, the membrane is not permeable to a virus. So if you put a virus at the top and it comes out of the bottom of the cells, it had to have gone through the cells and vice versa and so forth. Anyway, these... 
uh, this virus can infect these uh, polarized cells. It can infect from uh, the apical or the basal lateral domains. Hmm. And uh, the vi- viruses, the new viruses that are produced, are re- released uh, from both sides, apical and basal lateral, which would, you know, if you're just looking abstractly, if it's released apically, it would go out into the feces. Basal laterally, it could get into the circulation and spread. Right. Of course, if it doesn't come out basal laterally, it's not likely to spread. It's definitely a determinant of spread. Uh, and then they move to mice. And I believe this is a group that made one of the first uh, transgenic receptor mice, the dipeptidyl peptidase, was early on identified as cell receptor for MERS coronavirus. This group made a transgenic mice. I think we covered it here on TWIV and remembered that we remarked, why are the mice getting neurological disease? <laughs> right. In that model, remember? Right, which is a little bit unusual because there's not evidence for that yeah, in MERS. that's right. And so um, this model expresses the receptor in every cell of the mouse. And so that leads to high levels of it everywhere. Yep. And so you yep. might ask about it being at high levels in the intestinal tract, is that really a good model for this? Yeah. I remember at various meetings, people talking about this issue. There are other models out there now. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's this one is not, I think there are knock-in models where it's specifically, the receptor is specifically expressed where it's supposed to be, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, they take these mice, they inoculate them intragastrically. Does that mean you put a tube in right into the stomach, right? Mm -hmm. And so now the virus is in the stomach, which has all the nasties, right? And then it passes out into the intestine with more nasties, and they find that um, the mice get sick. They lose their body weight. Uh, One of them died. Uh, And um, if they include a proton pump inhibitor, Pepsid, (laughs) now pantoprazole, (laughs) but it's the same idea, right? That's right. (laughs) Um, this would make the purple pill <laughs> make it uh, less in, inactivated by the conditions. Um, they get better um, replication in the mice. So they, initially they got lethality, and then they could find um, they saw pathology in the in the epith- epithelium of the intestine. Um, they couldn't do plaque assays apparently because um, the intestinal homogenates killed their cell <laughs> cell monolayers. Yeah. yeah, that would be a problem. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, but the, later they were able to do it from the brain. They did do it. Brains weren't as toxic as the intestine. But they did so. see um, by PCR, they saw uh, viral antigens in the intestine of these mice, right? And they saw by PCR as well. Um, so it's clearly replicating in the intestine after intragastric. They also do direct injection, right, into the stomach. Yeah, they do mm-hmm. a surgery. Yeah, a laparotomy, and they, and they do that. And they get, they, I think it's more efficient that way. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so this is, it can replicate in the mouse uh, intestines after oral feeding. And then um, f- they, they detect virus in the lung five days after inoculation, especially right. in mice that got the proton pump inhibitor. Infectious viruses in lung homogenates five days after. And they could see histopathology in the lungs. And as Kathy said, they also develop brain infection five days after uh, intragastric inoculation. <clears throat> so you intragastrically inoculate these mice, they get infection in the intestinal mucosa, and they get respiratory and brain infection. Did they ever look for virus in the feces? I don't I don't think I don't they, recall did. That they did. did. I don't no. think so. It would have been interesting, right? I would have done It's very yeah. easy to collect pellets. Yeah. <laughs> Non-invasive. They're all yep. over the place. They'll give you all you want. <laughs> Packaged, prepackaged. Just pick up some else. Except yep. if you want to collect them clean, our experience was <laughs> that, of course, when you pick them up and you don't want it, they will poop. But when you <laughs> right. want it, they will not. That's right. That's right. That's right. So that is pretty good evidence that this virus will replicate in human intestinal cells of various types in a transgenic mouse and, and spread to the lung as well. So... What do we think? Real life scenario is this a major? Is this an important component of um, transmission? And well, it, it would explain. It would explain a lot of the uh, uh, mysteries that Kathy posed up front, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the, a lot of uh, 
uh, circumstances where one would suspect that it's not respiratory transmission. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the uh, finding virus in human feces occasionally. So it makes sense. It, it makes sense. The first, and, it, and these data certainly are are all supporting consistent. that notion. I, yeah. I did have a little objection in the discussion where they say we demonstrate that the human intestinal tract serves as an alternative infection route for mers cov yeah, that's a bit much, isn't that's it? A, a you don't much, really yeah. demonstrate that. It doesn't necessarily, but um, but this is all very consistent with that, and it all fits together nicely, and you see that this virus can replicate in human intestinal cells. In the mouse, it does, and it go, also goes to the lung. Um, so it, it all fits together very well, and as you said, it fits together well with the epidemiological observations that there are these cases that we can't really explain otherwise. Yeah. I just... Um, Remember, in people, it does not go, it does not transmit all that well from person to person. Right. You know, you get a few infections, like the Korean hospital, and but for the most part, it goes camel to person, maybe another person, and not much more. So if this is a route, it's still not terribly effective. I suspect that people now, when there are outbreaks, they'll, they'll look at this more carefully and try and get better data for it, right? Yeah. But there's not a lot of cases so far. What are the 2,000? 37 laboratory confirmed right. cases as of last summer. It's not a right. lot. No. Uh, dating back to 2013. And not only that, but uh, it is on the decline. If you uh, look at the charts, the total number of cases year by year, it has been steadily declining since it was uh, right. uh, first identified. And I have to assume that that has to do mostly with public health. Yeah, I would guess. Under, it, you know. Understanding what this is and uh, how, in terms of public health measures, to limit its transmission. Yeah, if you know it's coming from camels, you can limit the transmission. And eventually there'll be a camel vaccine, I presume, and that'll most likely be the end of it, which is good. Right, and also we, we have diagnostic tests for this now, so somebody shows up with it, it's not a mystery illness, and mm -hmm. they can then go into containment and you won't get the kind of spread that we saw in the past. Okay, Hopefully. now we move on to defective viruses. Yes. PLOS pathogens, reduced accumulation of defective viral genomes that contributes to severe outcome in influenza virus infected patients. Now, I really like this paper. I've seen it for a few weeks and I say, oh, do we need, do we have two weeks in a row of influenza? But it is flu season. Yes. What the heck? This is from, uh, let's see, Jasmina Vasilijevic. Vasilyevic. Vasilyevic. Noelia Zamareño. Do I have to keep... Uh, that's Oliveros, for... Rodriguez Franzen, Gomez, Rodriguez, Perez Ruiz, Rey, Abarba, Pozo, Casas, Nieto, y Falcón. From that... Nash... <laughs> work. Yes. What? I, I think the first name would be Vasilyevich. 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 Something like that. Center National Center for Biotechnology in Spain. Then Cyber Network de... Enfermedades Respiratorias, uh, the University Hospital San Pedro de Alcantara, Hospital Virgen de las Nieves, University Hospital Vigo, Complejo Hospitalario de Ciudad Real, and the Instituto de Salud Carlos III. <laughs> well, from Spain, clearly. I think it's Carlos Tres. Tres. <laughs> <laughs> sí. Now, this is, this is about why... Some people get really sick from influenza infections, and others don't. And yet, these people are apparently healthy, and of course, they've this, not been this vaccinated. This is one of the great mysteries of flu. Well, some of them, sometimes vaccinated people get very sick from it. That does that can happen, but yeah, one of the great mysteries of flu is these cases. We we think about this as a, a virus that particularly hits the elderly and very young kids, but then you've got a number of cases every season where somebody's hale and hearty and in the prime of life and just boom, they get into the ICU or they die. Why? So one idea, of course, is that you have viruses of different virulence circulating. Yes. It's always difficult to uh, address that. But here they have two influenza A H1N1 strains. These are all derived from the 2009 pandemic strain. One is isolated from a case, a fatal case. And they call that FIAV for fatal influenza A virus. And they have another from a patient with mild symptoms, MIAV. 
And um, and these were patients who had no known comorbidities. They weren't particularly sick. Yeah, they seemed to be healthy as far as we could tell. And um, in cell culture, uh, the, the F virus grows better. It's more pathogenic, pathog- pathogenic in mice. And so this paper is trying to figure out why. And it has to, all has to do with something that has been around for ages. Von Magnus particles. I love it. Just, <laughs> Defective yeah. interfering particles. Gosh, no, you know, in the old days, everyone was so excited about these and said these must have something to do with disease, but nobody figured it out. What and now we're seeing from this and other people working on this as well that they may have a lot to do with pathogenesis. So they and for flu uh, replication of any strain of flu, you will generate viruses where there are deletions, internal deletions in the RNA segments, and these lack lots of bases, so they don't encode for a functional protein, but they can be right. replicated. Flu, flu has this multi-segment genome, just to remind people, so the individual segments can be missing sections of them. So if you just took out one piece from one segment, it would cripple the virus But it, when it infected the cell. But these RNAs get replicated very effectively because they're small and they're recognized, the ends are recognized by the polymerase. So they get replicated. They uh, get incorporated into virus particles, but they reduce the titer of the virus, part, the, the virus preparation. And if you passage influenza virus at a high multiplicity of infection, that is you use a lot of viruses to infect cells, you will easily generate Defective interfering particles. I remember about five years ago, we were trying to grow some flu up. Now, remember, I did a PhD on flu, and I forgot everything I knew because I'm doing high MOI infections, which we do with picornaviruses, and the zero titer. I'm getting nothing. I get 10 to the 3 PFU per mil in my stock, so I called Peter Palazzi. He said, Vincent, you know <laughs> you have to use an MOI of 0.001. I said, oh, right. Forgot. It's so easy to make them because with picornas, you could pass a hundred times at an MOI of ten, and you wouldn't get defective interfering part. You have to try really hard. So flu just generates them like crazy. So and does VSV. VSV too. <laughs> so you do a high MOI passive VSV. You get easily DI particles. Oh yeah. 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 So we have to do low MOI passes as well for VSV, I right? Wonder what the wonder but, what the diff, what the what's the difference that one virus <laughs> does it and another doesn't. Don't know. Well, right off the bat, those are both negative strand yeah. RNA viruses, but right. I, I don't know. That doesn't necessarily explain it. How many yeah. segments in VSV? One. One. <laughs> well, there you have it. There it is. And there, there are DNA vir- <laughs> there are DNA viruses DNA viruses that do this as well. Sure. Uh, the uh, the the polyoma viruses do this. Mm-hmm. Is it um, the assembly that's screwed up or the actual transmission? Well, there's the got to be. Uh, Basically, what what it requires is you have to be able to generate a fragment of genetic material that has a it can replicate, so it has the appropriate signals for copying and can also package. Right. All right. And uh. um, and it does so in the presence of the wild type virus, but right, it interferes with the wild type virus. Hence, the yeah. interfering part of its name. Right. It's defective, and it's interfering. By the way, if, in case you're wondering. Von Magnus, okay, the Von Magnus phenomenon describes the generation of defective interfering particles by viruses, first observed by Preben von Magnus after serial passage of undiluted, undiluted allantoic fluid in eggs. So you grow the virus and you get it at the allantoic fluid out. Von Magnus, what year was that? Let's see. 1951. I'm looking at the reference. 1951. Uh, propag- propagation of the PR8 strain of influenza A in chick embryos. Two, formation of incomplete virus following inoculation of large doses of seed viruses. Acta path <laughs> at micral scanned, right? Scandinav- Scandinavian journal. 1951. So these particles that are defective, are those effective at inducing immunity to the non-defective particles? So the less defective particles you produce, the less immunity you generate. That's the paper. End of story. There we go. Is this not true? Yeah, yeah, it's a paper. Should we go to pics? (laughs) (laughs) That's it. I want you to all know that I I, I have no tricks up my sleeve. I've never read this paper before. So you thought it through, right? (laughs) Yeah, Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The defectives have lots of small RNAs that are really good inducers of innate responses, and so they 
replicate less, they're less pathogenic. Could this be the basis for why the vaccines don't often work? Well, in fact, I got an email last this morning asking that very same question. <laughs> <laughs> and what was the answer? <laughs> well, I don't think, first of all, it would, it, these viruses are not very, they, they infect, but they don't, they will not produce new virus particles, right? So this would be a one cycle vaccine. Mm, right. So maybe it would be okay, but on the other hand, you just get immunity to eight, to the surface glycoproteins, and I think you need to have some of the other proteins in there to get cellular epitopes, and so I'm not sure it would be a great vaccine. Um, it would be no better than the current one, which basically is a disrupted particle, and you just mainly have HA and NA. And nobody understands where this division comes from, where the effective particles and the defective particles occur. Do you know what the dividing point is in the replication cycle? What do you mean the dividing point? Well, I mean, a cell has accumulated these particles that makes, don't so affect. In fact, the cell makes both. And exactly. Yeah. So where does the dividing point well, come from, or does it happen independently from independent genomes? Every infection. And some, if you package one of these defective RNAs in a particle, that particle will initiate an infection, but that's it. It will never make a new right. particle, because it's lacking and, some genetic No, no, no I got it. And right? if you uh, think about the genome structure of the defective interfering particles, as depicted in this paper for influenza, they have the ends. So you think about some mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. polymerase error that mm -hmm. leads to a jumping or some kind of yeah. RNA recombination. or I mean, you can speculate a lot of things, but it's something in the replication of the RNA that leads you to get these RNAs that are defective. Right. right. Genomes. Yeah. Well, anyway, you, you got it. Yes. No, go there's, but there's a packaging problem with influenza, right? You've got to get all eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in the same right. virus particle in order to get an infectious That's unit. correct. That's correct. So yeah. that sounds pretty hard to do if I were well, to the, the sequences in random are, combinations. The sequences are at the ends, the packaging sequences. So even these DI particles will get packaged. That's why they right. get But packaged. they're missing right. segments in between. They're yes. missing sequences yes, in between. And, yeah. and as a result, the more of these defective genomes you have floating around, the more likely it is that one will get packed into yeah. um, a, a particle, and that particle, of course, will then be defective. So these are going to dilute out the good genomes. So this is an extravagant virus with regards to viral replication. Extravagant? Yes. What do you mean? Yeah, because it mm -hmm. wastes a lot of energy making defective No, that's your defective. view. That's your human <laughs> all, view. You all, you, all you need is to <laughs> infect the next cell. Just need, right? That's right. That's I'm right. worried about efficiencies here. That's all I'm talking about. Yeah, forget it. You when you're using, slob. We could when talk you're about using the host's <laughs> machinery, why do you care about efficiency? Yeah, I mean, you're not just using it, but you're you're cranking it up, right? We're turning wow. up the meta, the yeah. thermostat, yeah. in fact. I, I, and so, um, yeah, you just I need one. Choosing sides here. I was no, just no, I know. I'm just saying that you have to be careful about using your perceptions of the world when you think about well efficiency. Viruses. That's just a you know. Just yeah. Anyway, so this paper okay. they study these two isolates, F and M, for fatal and mild, mild. which and, I had to keep. Reminding myself yes. what they meant because I was going female and male and yes, fatal and mild, and it's hard to keep things straight. I found with this paper, but we'll we'll make it simple. So fatal grows faster in cell culture, more pathogenic in mice. They do some sequencing to quantify the amount of defective RNAs in these two preparations, and as. Dixon said <laughs> before he hit the microphone because he's he's showing it. I'm with emulating his hands. Uh, actually your earlier. So the fatal virus has ten times lower that's incredible. effective RNAs than the mild one. Right. I was really pleased to see a tenfold effect. We don't see <laughs> enough of that right. nowadays. Yeah. Are there any strains of influenza that don't make any defective particles? Not aware of them. I mean, they say here that you can get it with. Pretty much everything. Now, everything is a strong conclusion, right, in biology? Very strong. So maybe we just haven't found it yet. Okay. But um, I would think that they all make, to a certain extent. We've, right? we've replicated the 1918 influenza virus out outbreak, right? How does that one compare? To we this? have made the virus, yes. How does that compare? I don't know if people have looked at defective part. That's an interesting question. Maybe it <coughs> maybe it hardly makes any, right, Dixon? That is an interesting question. Yeah, yeah. and it contributes yeah. to the high pathogenicity. That's um, a real interesting question. I like Dixon. Yes. Right Grant. Go do the experiment. See what I get when I show up early? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, yeah. It, That's it, an easy experiment yeah, to do. Because you, you hear the story as it unfolds, and you can yeah. participate in thinking about it, right? Well, when you show up with five minutes left, 
you know, we're, we're but I understand you're teaching a course. I'm not no, trying to pick on you. We're approaching you. TWIV 500. I finally learned something. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a testament to persistence, right? There you go. So the, that's the, a different topic. For the idea true. here is that you make, if you make a lot of defective RNAs, you're going to be a better inducer of interferon. So they measure that. Um, and in fact, it's true. These DI, high DI generating viruses make more, induce more interferon. And they also assay the proteins that are induced by interferon, the so-called interferon stimulated genes, and they, they go up as well. I have another question. Yeah, sure. And here you have a fatal strain and a mild strain. Yeah. Do they yeah. produce the same number of particles total, except that one produces less defective particles and the other one produces more defective particles? Well, that's a good question. I don't, I don't remember them looking at that. Uh, well, I don't either, and later, I kind of wanted it. Yeah. Uh, don't they? Yes. Later on, they make uh, some recombinant viruses mm -hmm. that have different characteristics with respect to this and compare their properties and culture, and they grow just the same. But these, no, they say that the, the, the fatal one grows faster in cell culture. Yeah, that's right. In, right. Yeah. In, but that, in that particular case, some of these more better defined recombinants grow just the same in cell culture. Trying to see if but it's, 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 it's they're producing fewer form. defective particles. Are they producing as many infective particles? I'm right. looking That's for that here. I'm looking for that. In one case, in one case, yes. In Figure Four, if you look at, if you compare, the, we'll get to it. Because right. the the DIs interfere also with with right. regular virus. Right. If it gets in the cell with an infective right. particle, it's going to interfere. That's then, why they call them DI particles. No, I got right. it. I got it. I got it. So. Um, all right, so there's higher induction of interferon responses when you have more. So that would then restrict viral replication. And if you make fewer, if you make a lower interferon response, you get more replication and more pathogenicity. Right. So the idea here is that the one, the mild virus is cranking out a lot of defective particles. It, it tips off the innate immune system, yes. which promptly initiates a response against that virus yeah. in the host and, and, squashes it, um, whereas the fatal virus doesn't produce all these defective particles. It takes it longer to kick off the innate immune process, by which point the virus has already spread and you've got this much more severe disease. That's right. the idea. And they're both H1N1? That's right. They're both derived from the 2009 H1N1. H1N1. Right. They, they look next in mice in the lungs of infected mice to see whether this difference in DI RNA also occurs there, and it does. more. De defective RNAs in uh, the M infected mice than in the F infected mice. So that's nice that you can see I, it I in the animal, right? I don't know if we uh, specified this, but, uh, but what is actually triggering the immune response here is the RNAs from these DIs, right. presumably. Yes, that's correct. It's right. a tweaking uh, intracellular receptors that sense these RNAs as being foreign and triggers the uh, interferon response. Right, which the normal viral, the the intact viral RNA would also do, I assume, mm -hmm. right? right? I would assume so yeah, as well. It should yeah, the should. DIs maybe are there. There are more. So maybe it's, uh, and also, if they're shorter, they can be more efficient inducers. Okay, as well. right. Yeah. All right. Next, what mutations in the <laughs> genome are responsible for this? So they have both sequences of the F and the M virus. Um, the there are nine amino acid changes in the F isolate. That's the fatal isolate. Nine. And they focus on two in the polymerase uh, because they figure these are the ones that are mainly involved in the generation of defective particles. Um, and they show that if you introduce these uh, in individually um, into a parental virus, you can mimic the difference in, in defective virus preparation. In fact, one single amino acid gives you 27-fold higher uh, levels of defective RNA than, wow. the, than the parental virus that they introduce the change into. Uh, and that's a change in one of the subunits of the polymerase. And that, so now you've introduced a single amino acid change, which has this effect, um, gives you um, more defective RNA accumulation, and you can uh, look at the replication of that in cell culture and I, did they put that in mice? Yes, they they looked in cell culture. They I don't remember if they looked in mice, uh, but they did look at the antiviral response and show that again this single amino acid change can 
attenuate the antiviral response. And they did put them in mice. Uh, they did put them in mice. So they, f- they have a series of viruses, and they can show that the more, the, the, just one amino acid change where you get more, 27 times more defective RNA produced dramatically attenuates the, the virulence right. of the virus in mice. So it's all been reconstituted in mice. And then finally, the last thing they do is they go into people, they have a cohort of patients with um, either severe or mild in- infection, and they've sequenced these genomes. Uh, and these are all from people with no comorbidities, right? Um, they show, again, the correlation of severe disease with making less defective RNA in samples, in viruses from patients, a cohort of patients. They've sequenced those. They don't have the same mutations as the ones they've been studying in these papers, but you know the idea is that you could probably get Defective RNA is produced by a variety of different mutations in the. That to me is one. That to me is one of the coolest parts of the paper. They talk about viruses. uh, Some of the viruses they talk about elsewhere are viruses that are in this matrix protein that make uh, excess Mm. uh, amounts of defective uh, interfering particles, and uh, presumably, I had to. Well, they say this in the discussion. Presumably, that's because of a packaging issue. Yeah. Um, so maybe it allows it allows smaller RNAs to be more effectively packaged. That mutation. something like yeah. that. Yeah. But what what interests me about this is that uh, this provides potentially a common mechanism for increased virulence, resulting from a bunch of different types of mutations in the yes. virus that you could you could puzzle about forever and never understand why it was that something both in the matrix in either the matrix mm-hmm, protein mm-hmm. or the polymerase yeah, that's right. would give you this increased virulence but this provides potentially a common mechanism that's right. for that and other, I, yeah, that to other, me was really interesting. otherwise you're confused wow how could right. it be yeah that's which in point. fact we have been about uh flu virulence yeah. i mean i'm not, i i would suspect that this is not the only mechanism there no. might be others as well, but this could be a big one. It's really interesting. So here's let's talk a little bit about virulence. So I always have an issue with viruses evolving towards higher virulence, right? Because I, I want to understand what's the function. But here I think it's very clear you have in, increased replication in the lung. So you make fewer DI RNAs, you get increased lung replication, and that, that has got to help with transmission, right? As Dixon would say, it's more efficient. More efficient. Indeed. Is that what he would say? <laughs> he might. I think so. <laughs> it, so that makes perfect sense. The virulence is actually a side effect, right? It's it, right. As they say here, the host has an overzealous re- immune response to this increased replication, and that causes the pathogenesis. The, but the virus, it, it, so cause, calling these more virulent in a way is weird. I have a I feel weird about it because it's just increased replication and it's the host that is causing the disease. But of course, host responses are part of virulence. That's so anyway, the whole pathogenesis here, here the increased virulence makes perfect sense. And I can understand why it would be selected for because it really is, you know, in the end, finding a new host is the main selective pressure. And whatever else you can do to achieve that higher replication, more stability outside the host and so forth, you can imagine those changing. This makes perfect sense. However, not every virus makes low amounts of DI particles. It hasn't evolved so that every virus is, is doing this. Why not? And it, maybe there's a fitness cost associated with this. So you still have a mixture of high and low DI particles circulating. In other words, why, why do the mild viruses still yeah, exist? Yeah, exactly. They must be good enough to... Because their hosts live. <laughs> well, that's right. I part That may be. That may yeah, be. Yeah, what occurred to me is this may... It, it may sort of represent... Um, I'm going to anthropomorphize some more, but two different <laughs> philosophies. You can you can infect your host rapidly and produce as much progeny virus as possible in the lungs to get to the next host as quickly as possible, and that makes a very virulent virus. Or you can infect more slowly with all these defective particles and you trip off the innate immunity earlier and your host uh, feels okay to go to work and is just coughing all over people, and so you spread over a longer period of time. So you're saying they both work. They both they, work. I, I think the evidence, yeah. the, the epidemiological evidence tells us that they both work because we have both types right. of virus circulating. Right. Right. So last time we had a talk about 
or a paper about the presence of virus in, in, in the cough itself, in the expectorant, in the aerosol. Mm-hmm. Right. And it's only present for one or two days, they said. Yeah, it's mostly before symptoms. Yeah. Right. So <laughs> with the more virulent virus, is it present uh, longer? Don't, that's a good that's question. That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, if you assume it's the same, then they could be transmitting before they die, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so on the other there... hand, if they're if they're transmitting while lying in bed incapacitated, they may reach fewer other hosts. Yes, right. Well, I was just right. going to raise that question. <laughs> yeah, I think in a hospital you're going to infect people in the hospital, but you know, but you're, the people caring for you are going to go outside, right? So they could be infected. And but I just have yeah. a sense that that would be less extensive than a person wandering around part of society, right? right. Right, right. And the other thing, of course, is that all these small, poor, unfortunate kids that have died this year from this flu out- outbreak, yeah, yeah. this this could actually be shown now in their lung tissue as to whether or not they yeah, it's were a good, producing. You could, you could definitely take the viruses and say, see. Is there a correlation? Yeah. It's yeah. almost too simple. Almost. <laughs> not quite. <laughs> it's almost but too yeah, quiet. I think that, was, that is worth doing to take now. No. Okay. It's for a whole range. As yes. long as people aren't terribly otherwise sick, immunosuppressed or something. Right. So then, it, yeah. can we sequence fast enough in a person who is heading towards fatality to determine whether or not it's a an F or an M virus? And then, if it's an F virus, can we then stimulate interferon to actually prevent further replication of the virus? I think by the time the person shows up at the hospital, it's, it's too late. It's not going to make a difference over, because yeah. you've, yeah. they're... they're the reason they're showing okay. up at the hospital is because of their immune response. Because remember, oh, we have antivirals, but they're no good right. unless you catch the that's infection right. within a day or two. Exactly. So that's right. the same idea. And the antivirals, yeah. you know, giving people interferon is kind of nasty. Oh, yeah. yes. Oh, so no. the antivirals <laughs> A lot of side be effects, better. of course. I'd rather have a side effect than walk out of the hospital eventually than well, right. no side effects. <laughs> So I think it would be interesting to know uh, in a community, right, if you have outbreaks like we have now, what's circulating, right? Exactly. What kinds of viruses are circulating? And now in this particular severe season, you know, are, is there a lot of F virus circulating? So anyway, it's a cool paper. And it, and it points to some bioinformatics stuff that people can do as more sure. of these viruses get yeah. sequenced. You can look at the sequences and say, what, is, what effect is this going to have on defective viral genome production? Yeah, right. Kathy, are you still there? Yes. <laughs> I just want to make she's sure. Breathless. Sometimes yeah. you sometimes you disconnect and. Um, oh no! I but no, not she's, eating. Kathy, she's remember not remember a long time ago, Alice Wong used to be interested in VSVDIs and their role in pathogenesis, but yeah. never could really do. Yeah. Anything. No, I mean that was a big uh, emphasis in the Holland Lab too. Yeah. DI particles yeah. and yeah, and their role in disease, right? But mm-hmm. now I think we have a nice. Uh, connection here so it's Kathy, cool. Kathy was just waiting to exhale <laughs> yes so exhale all right so there you go um <laughs> a few a few emails Anne writes please don't gender balance the studies you choose to review be politically incorrect gender blind and in fact scientific by continuing to choose studies based on popular interest and timeliness this will help the population at large, both men and women. My humble opinion and wish, Anne. I think we we don't. I just we just pick papers that look good, right? Mm-hmm. I wonder I, why did we mention this at all? Oh, uh, well, we talk is, about gender balance. A lot. We do, and this was um, part of my my pick from last week. Um, I think it was last week that I picked Ed yeah, Young's article right. on gender balance in science reporting, and I would I would urge Anne to reread Ed's article. Uh, where he addresses exactly this issue, because it turns out that if you just go to the literature and you pick the articles that are quote unquote interesting, you end up calling up a lot of white dudes. Um, And the reason for that is because they are statistically the ones who are more likely to end up in prominent news articles elsewhere. And so there's a self-reinforcing aspect of this. And so I, I, I agree that we sh- our emphasis should be on the science, but we need to be aware that the science takes place in a larger social context, which is systematically skewed, and we need to try and apply some correction for that skew. Dixon, would you take the next one? Sure. Dylan, Dylan writes, hello, Dr. Twiv. David. David. He's Not- on a different one. Whoops. Oh, yeah. There's another Dylan. There's How did Dylan. that happen? I don't know. I don't either. I, I'm, I'm working my way to David. Oh, Dylan was up there. Yeah. Uh, David writes, Dear Twiv, 
While listening to TWIV 478, Vincent was surprised about the TEDx statement that 120 years was mentioned as the most we can go to, and wondered why the presenter was looking how to go beyond it. I'm guessing that the number 120 is not a mere coincidence or vague estimate. While I am not very church-minded, I do wonder about life and like to read classic literature of all sorts, and in one of my detours recently stumbled upon Genesis 3, 6, which goes... 6, 3. <laughs> 6, 3. I'm sorry. Right. I'm, People I'm, are going to go looking I'm, this I'm up. I'm lisdectic. Sorry. <clears throat> Genesis 6, 3, which goes something like, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, but that, but that so... But that he also is flesh, yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. <laughs> well, the context that, in quotes, God was angry because his angels had come down from heaven and had procreated with human ladies and decided to put a limit to it. It rather surprises me that the Bible is so unambiguous in this age limit, and furthermore, it's the very beginning of the book. It must be incorporated into Jewish, Christian, and Muslim beliefs alike. In any case, as God himself, <laughs> God, forget that. Can't read I can't, today, dude. I can't, no, I was trying to degenderize God, <clears throat> and I couldn't think of an equivalent. As God himself established well, this limit. Well, you could just take out himself. If no, God no, 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 I want to write, I want to read this letter. You could say it itself. <laughs> I, I almost well, did. No, this is, this is the Judeo-Christian God. I almost did that. I almost did that. <laughs> <laughs> it may not be. Uh, a wonder that scientists wish to push the age beyond this point. I do not really want to speculate on the desirability or probability of defying this limit, as I have learned in life that nothing sets bad blood as easily as talking about religion or politics, but I thought you might want to add this datum to your knowledge base. Kind regards, David. Well, Perfect. It's not quite data, but that's okay. It's interesting. Yeah. I think 120 is the oldest anyone has gotten right i'm not sure about that i think no? not i don't think anybody's actually hit that number yet why don't you hit it i'm trying i'm trying <laughs> that's a quote from jack benny <laughs> 100 okay the the verified oldest people number one is gene Calment, who's 122 years and really? 164 days old wow. really so wow blasphemy 122 days that yeah. goes way beyond right. god's prediction it's amazing. And that's what the internet is telling me. But <laughs> well, right. Believe what you died, wish, Alan. Believe 19, what you wish. <laughs> died 1997. Holy. She was French, so maybe good Holy French wine girl. is the way. <laughs> yeah, Bible has a number of individuals who live to be like 900 years old. Well, the Methuselah yeah. was an exception, right? Methuselah, Noah, Adam. That's right. Several others. Yeah. Kathy, can you take the next one? Please? Uh oh. Uh -huh. You don't want to do it? No, no, I'm just, where am I? Okay, K, uh, okay. K right. Right, 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 right. Dear Twivers, first, many thanks for this great podcast, which I listened to since episode one. Unfortunately, I'm usually four to five weeks behind, and this is why I rarely write in, although I often intend to. Today, I'm in a bad mood, weather, etc., so please allow me a little rant. Just stop reading if you feel that I got carried away, that I get okay, carried away. Enough. <laughs> next letter is from <laughs> i'm a bioinformatics person of sorts the kind of guy who thinks he knows everything but cannot even run an sds page not to mention a plaque assay unlike you kind twiv folks i have an extremely skeptical attitude towards surprise findings and the publication of such especially if done by fellow bioinformatics people while your immediate reaction to this kind of papers apparently is to marvel about the wonders of nature science bioinformatics and such my first reaction is to go to the computer and try to find where the mistake is or what kind of <laughs> artifact the researchers <laughs> fell for. Right. Case in question. The lizard syncytion gene and the importance of syncytions for placenta biology in general. Not that I'm an expert in placentas or retroviruses or syncytions, but you don't need to be one to notice that there is something not quite right here. I can agree that mammalian syncytions are expressed in the placenta and have some kind of role there because the double knockout does have a placental phenotype. However, the evidence that syncytions are linked to the origins of the placenta are very, very poor. There are lots of other genes which, when knocked out, give a similar or more severe placental phenotype. Moreover, syncytions are everywhere, well, almost everywhere. <laughs> I didn't care to read the PNAS paper by Cornelis at all particularly carefully, so apologies to the authors if I misunderstood them. However, the figure one, which you liked so much, looks misleading at best. The authors highlight some branches, 
mammals and their strange placental lizards in red, <laughs> indicating that these species have known sensations, claiming a striking claiming a striking sensation to placenta cor- correlation. A quick bioinformatical search reveals this to be an example of quote selective data presentation. Sensation-like proteins are found in lots of species without a red line, including various birds, chicken, exclamation point, <laughs> non-placental <laughs> lizards, anole, fishes, salmon, and best of all, trypanosomes. <laughs> Maybe Dixon can say a few words about the prevalence <laughs> of placental protists. That's a whole program in <laughs> itself, and I don't have time right now, but I'll be glad to consider it. Placental <laughs> protists, that's good. Yes. Yeah. Admittedly, these genes are not called sensitions, but rather endogenous retrovirus and like proteins. But they are at least as sensation like as the reported skink protein. I will spare you the details, but the allegedly non existing sensation chicken sensation is called FET1 for Female Express Transcript 1. And he gives a link. <laughs> so better watch out for the elusive chicken placenta. <laughs> this was by far not the only one of your recent Twix papers that I have quibbles with. Uh-oh. Uh, the next one we could skip because it's Twivo, but I'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> the additional P53 copies in elephants from a recent Twivo episode is another one of those. Initially, I thought, how interesting. Backup copies of a major tumor suppressor in a big animal make a lot, makes a lot of sense. But then your guest made a throwaway remark that these genes have lost their DNA binding domain. Oh, darn. Seriously? Without this part, the genes are as likely to be tumor suppressors as a car without a motor is likely to drive me home. The whole situation screams pseudogene, maybe a transcribed one, but pseudo nevertheless. And don't get me started about the Mimi virus equals the fourth domain of life, bogus. Okay, having said that, I'm feeling better now. Here's a suggestion for a future <laughs> TWIV paper since you seem to like this stuff. And then he gives these two links, and these are the ARC yeah. papers, right? Yeah. Oh. So these two papers would nicely continue the ARC, pun intended, on repurposed retroviral proteins. Why should the ENV genes hog all the spotlight? Best wishes, K. So I have, to, I have to tell you that I have another letter from K about the ARC papers, <laughs> really? which he also doesn't like, even though he, suggested even though he, he sent them. He or she. Um, so we will save that for a future episode. The one letter that I wrote, though, I wrote, uh, let's try this again. The one letter that I read, however, would make a nice link to this, and you could call it Noah's Ark. Yes. <laughs> now, um, so Kay is a bioinformatician, computational biologist. Mm-hmm. And so there were experiments in that paper that were also compelling. For example, um, the protein is produced in the placenta. Right. Uh, it is fusogenic, which, of course, you would expect from an um, envelope derivative, right? Um, but those are beyond just the, the the computational aspects of the paper, and I think that's why it it's compelling. But the authors do say, you know, this doesn't prove that this is the origin. It's just yeah. an interesting observation that it might be suggestive of it, and so I, I, I await uh, additional information this idea that the sensations are everywhere, but uh, it, that's because endogenous retroviruses are everywhere as well, right? But they all haven't been exapted. This particular gene was is not part of, if I remember, it's not part of an endogenous retrovirus. It's been pulled out and placed somewhere else in the genome, and it's under control of a cellular promoter and so forth. So that's part of the exaptation process. So uh, you know, you're going to find a lot of these in other animals as well. The question is whether it's it's apart from the endogenous retrovirus. It's and, not just that they're there; it's that they're being used. Yeah, right. Uh, anyway, um, I, I I understand your your skepticism, and uh, I think sure. you need to just and, and I think skepticism drives science. So people are going to address this and see if it's right or not. Um, but um, I I do think that um, these are really really interesting and that's why we get excited about them because it's different for us right uh, this, by the way this sort of, don't have placentas i just wanted to set the record straight <laughs> on that <laughs> they have flagella they have a flagellar um, apparatus that looks really nice and an undulating membrane that could be mistaken as a placenta if you didn't know what you were looking at this sort of skepticism as we've already suggested is is really useful it all yeah, reminds yeah. me of no question the, the years when i was in buffalo when when uh, Ed Niles and I had adjoining laboratories. And it was 
every time I went over to him excited about some result, he would have <laughs> a dozen or two dozen <laughs> reasons why this was wrong. Right. Okay. And I, it was just infuriating because he would just throw water all over it, but it would generate the other dozen controls that I needed to do to really <laughs> nail it down. All right. But there are some people who are just negative mm. about everything, right? Right on that. <laughs> and, and, th- and it turns out that everything is not wrong, right? No. So, you, so uh, I appreciate that skepticism is important, but uh, I definitely know people who think everything is wrong. So that's not right. good either. Now here, I'm going to send this Tuivo issue to uh, Vinnie Lynch, who was our guest on that episode. We'll see what he says. And then the, the fourth domain, we agree that it's bogus. Totally. Oh, yeah. If, if you have to, oh, yeah. Listen, we totally have agreed with that over and over. So don't. No problem. You can. You don't have to get started. We're on your side there. <laughs> um, Alan, can you? No, you just did that one, didn't you? Did you? No, no. Please take. Please that. take Mark's. Thank yeah, you. I'll take Mark's. <laughs> uh, Mark writes, dear Twivadrome. This is follow up for episode four thirty six from almost a year ago, April twenty seventeen. There's an outbreak of canine influenza in California, and local news stations are beating the drum to educate dog owners. One of our dogs is very social. During our walks, he approaches and greets other dogs by sniffing their snouts and tails. The other goes to a groomer regularly. For the past several years, our vet has recommended H3N2 flu vaccinations. Soon the dogs will go to a kennel for several weeks while my wife goes on vacation. I called our vet to discuss the flu situation. She said they now have a new-to-market bivalent vaccine for both H3N2 and H3N8 strains. I wanted to know more, and via a little Googling, found this site, uh, (laughs) dogflu.com. Great. (laughs) <laughs> um, it's a great information resource. Note that dogflu.com is sponsored by Merck, so some naysayers may object to it. I have no relationship with Merck. <laughs> this map image attached shows spread of both strains of canine influenza, especially interesting, uh, and gives the URL of the outbreak map. This pa- The page cites work done at Cornell. This triggered a memory of hearing TWIV with Cornell participants. Guests were discussing rapid spread of a new canine flu variant from greyhound races in Florida. I have re-downloaded that episode, 436, and I'm almost half done re-listening to it. Mm-hmm. Um, you, the Twivadrome folks, have created a vast audio library and resource. Here's a tip on how I search it. Using Google or Bing, it's possible to restrict the search to a specific domain. The syntax for doing this, uh, yes, you put in a site operator, uh, site colon, for example, site colon microbe.tv, will limit the search for the keywords to the microbe.tv domain. A Google search for canine influenza site mm. microbe TV reveals 54 hits with the earliest being TWIV42 from July 2009, which I've also downloaded for re-listening. Wow. Cheers, Mark. Well, thank you, Mark. Wow. Glad that was helpful. Hey. We had an episode nine, I think. Really? Uh, really early on. That's but, just yeah. you and me. <laughs> yeah, the dog flu. Uh, dog flu site is not loading for me. Really? Oh, choose, choose the next link. The next. Ah, uh, okay. Duckflu.com. Wow. Yeah, there it is. Ah, uh, look at the social dogs. <laughs> well, uh, just, you have to use the HTTPS yeah. domain to get in. Yes, lots of pictures of doggies, and they've got states with reported dog flu. That's a good. Actually, t- this has a nice. Uh, it has a nice uh, time animated uh, spread of these over the years yes. so starting in tennessee and florida in 2007 and you can watch it spread to all the other states neat anyway that's a good that's a good way to search because um and we've talked about it before but um it gets rid of all the other stuff and we did an early one uh, I, I was looking at the old episodes recently dixon and we had an early an outbreak of dog flu in 2009 yeah wow way back when uh, one more. Rich, please read the next one. Mar, uh, Max writes, Dear Distinguished TWIV Crew, Hello again. I am currently finishing my PhD, hopefully about six months left, and would like to do a postdoc with a PI who studies viruses in some capacity. <laughs> <laughs> when I began graduate school, I intended to study virus-host interactions, but ended up getting wooed by my current PI and have been studying ribosomes ever since. Hmm. It's been a great ride, so no complaints, but I haven't stopped thinking viruses are just the coolest. You're thinking correctly. I would love to know if you've got any advice for someone hoping to transition into your super interesting but extremely complex field of study, like should I start with a broad overview 
of all kinds of viruses or pick a family and dive really deep. I'd also like to know if there are any areas of the field you think might be on the brink of really breaking out. Phage microbiome interactions, viral evolution, now that the stupid NIH restrictions on research have been lifted. <laughs> Thanks for the great show, Max, who's uh, in Jupiter, Florida. You have a Coursera course. You could, course you could read you could the PS. Uh, okay. P.S. I'm the same guy who wrote it a few weeks ago about the aerodynamics of pregnant birds and bats. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> okay. We like the way you think, Good. Max. Yeah. 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 No, uh, uh, Max, it sounds like Max wants to do a postdoc, right? And all kinds of viruses are always on the brink of breaking out. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. So what's breaking out virology? Yeah. <laughs> uh, he, Max wants to do a postdoc, it sounds, right? Yes. How to uh, transition yeah. into your soup? So you do a postdoc in virology, right? If yeah. you want to if you want to learn some virology, well, you could go to my video lectures, which are all online. The Coursera course is down. I'm trying to revise it, it until yeah. it, it's it's offline until I revise it. You could go to youtube.com slash P-R-O-F-E-R-R and you'll find my lectures, which are updated every year. And we're on lecture seven already this year. And you could uh, read, you could listen to TWIV, actually. That would really help. Sounds like he does. You could uh, go to ASV. Go to ASV, yeah. Mm -hmm. You yep. could. Oh, that's a great ASV. idea. You know, that is a ASV great would be idea. good. Yep. That way you could uh, put, identify potential you know, you, advisors. Uh, you may not be able to uh, get somebody, your current advisor or somebody else to sponsor you to do that. And it would cost you, what, $500 for uh, registration and uh, then some travel and housing. So, you know, you could be into it for $1,000, but it might be one of the best $1,000 you've ever spent. Yep. I think that's a terrific idea. Early bird registration for graduate students is four hundred seventy-five dollars. If they're, uh, it yeah, it doesn't even matter if they're a member or not. So four hundred seventy-five. Yep. There's on on Twiv. There's a list of guests that we've had. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You could check those out. All right. Also, there's a virology job site. Now we're in the process of getting that revamped and completely reworked, but. Uh, Watch for it. I think you can still go to it now, but at some point we're going to transition to the new site. And we were hoping to do that by the end of February, but I'm not sure when that'll actually happen. But you can get to that from the main ASV site. So that you could look at that and see what kinds of postdocs are available uh, where people actually, you know, presumably have money and so forth. Um, that doesn't mean that you couldn't write to somebody based on your interest in their virus or their work. All right, we have a book contest to announce the winner. This one is easy because it's the high score in CD4 Hunter. I, I just finished reading Ready Player One, so this feels uh, very familiar, actually. Picking the high scores, and we're going to give them the big prize. Eric, I must say I've never been very good at video games. CD4 Hunter is particularly hard for me. Those darn antibody attacks. They attach a screenshot. 1050. Mitchell. 1050. I've killed many T cells. If that's not worth a free book, I don't know what is. Mitchell got 3,580. That's good. Megan. Alan, read Megan's. Uh, thanks for the awesome podcast. My adoptive lab and I are always gushing over how awesome a resource you all are. We love listening to the weekly editions and occasionally go back to the virology lectures or send to grad students that way since we don't have enough of a formal virology course at the moment. Anyway, it's foggy and somewhere above freezing as I write this. I'm a fourth-year PhD student hoping to finish up by the end of 2018. I study the evolution of the fish virus, VHSV, and dabble a bit into immunology. I'm an academic orphan at the University of Toledo, and I use your wealth of podcasts as, makeup, as a makeup for my lack of lab meetings journal club. I wanted to get my score out to you for a chance at a book before I forget since I'm a busy TA this, this semester. Um, P.S. Forgot to mention Dr. Krishnamurthy. My adoptive advisor deserves a shout out here for making me sure I continue to have space and support in my foster department. And Megan got 2,080. Rich, read the next one, please. Peter writes, Dear Professors Twiv, I have started to email in my answers for case studies to Twip, but a <laughs> chance of a uh, chance of a book by Peter Hotez was enough to encourage me to try my luck at Twiv. <laughs> I have no idea if my score of fifty two fifty is anywhere good. <laughs> And also had no idea before playing how good red blood cells are at blocking viruses. <laughs> I've really enjoyed listening to the discussions on flu vaccination. I'm embarrassed to say 
I have only been vaccinated once when I was interning at CDC Atlanta. In Ireland, only those in at-risk groups are urged to get the vaccine. From the HSE, HSE website, quote, at-risk groups, we are urging people in at-risk groups to get the flu vaccine. We strongly recommended the vaccine if you are over 65, pregnant, have a long-term health condition, work in healthcare, are a carer, live in a nursing home, uh, in regular contact with pigs, poultry, or waterfowl. Rich, Don't excuse get- me for interrupting, but you read the first two lines of that very fast, and it says, <laughs> are 65 years of age and over uh, and are pregnant. <laughs> I would like to meet that woman because I don't think there has ever been – I might be wrong about 120 be years. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, those are separate categories. Sorry Sarah. about that. Separate categories. <laughs> yeah, yeah, understood. Understood. Don't get the flu vaccine if, you've had a, if you have had a severe – allergic anaphylaxis reaction to a previous dose or any part of the vaccine vaccination should be rescheduled if you have an acute illness with a temperature greater than 38 and 38 c end quote do you know why uh, the herd immunity approach is not being promoted by our national health service are we just behind the times or could it uh be uh could it have to do with our small population Perhaps it is as simple as the flu vaccine being free here for at-risk groups. So if it was recommended for everybody, people would say it should be free for everyone. Even then, from what I've heard from the podcast, I am, uh, am I right in thinking it probably would make economic sense for the government to encourage mass vaccination to take pressure off already struggling hospitals plus the loss of rec- revenue due to sick days, et cetera. Uh, anyway, thanks uh, for the great work. I'm understanding more and more the more I listen, all the best. Peter, um, who's in Dublin. So the, the uh, universal you know. recommendation took years to get put in place in the U.S., and there was a lot of back and forth about what mm-hmm. this was going to cost and whether it was good, whether the benefits would be worth the cost and yada, yada, yada. And then finally, I believe it was the 2009 pandemic that that broke this issue and they said, OK, fine, we'll just recommend it for everybody over the age of six months. But it used to be in the U.S. that it was um, – the CDC said anybody over the age of six months can get the flu vaccine. We especially recommend it for these subgroups. Um, now they recommend it for everybody. So that was that that's relatively recent. I would expect that um, that in Ireland there probably is a, an issue with paying for it. Um, that would be part of the reason they would do this. Mm-hmm. And also they want to focus the attention on the on the groups that are most likely to need it. So there are there are arguments to be made there. Personally, I think um, it does make a lot of sense to just have the universal recommendation. It's a whole lot simpler to communicate, and it just it just makes sense for everybody. We well. had the same issue in the U.S. for the hepatitis B virus vaccine. Yes, uh, because they initially prescribed that for at risk groups, and then basically they found that they couldn't even cover those adequately unless they just said, "Forget it. Let's just do everybody." Yeah. Well. Uh- Looks like Peter has the high score because our last entrant, Alex, got 4,680. Yep. So Peter's the winner. Peter wins. Send us your address, <laughs> twiv at microbe.tv. Let's do some picks. Alan, what do you have? I have uh, the winner of a, a scientific photo contest, <laughs> and this is just really a jaw-dropping. <laughs> it's a, they managed to take a picture of a single atom. So they have this system that that confines an atom in one spot, and the photographer managed to do a timed exposure with this atom suspended between the two probes of this device. And then the article that I've linked to explains how the experiment was done. And you see if you, you, you have to click on the photo to blow it up, but then when you look at it, there's a little tiny white dot right there in the middle. And that is That's a single, it? that is a single atom. It seems too big. It, well, it's it's, um, it's amplified. By it's anything. it's fluorescing basically. Yeah, okay. It's it's Got emitting it. light, and um, that's what you're seeing is the light being emitted by that atom. Got it. But that's being produced by a cool. single atom. It's you know, cool. this is years ago when we first saw individual virus particles. Same thing; they were fluorescently labeled, so it was amplifying mm-hmm. the signal. Yeah. So is that the this, device that Stephen Chu invented as part of his Nobel Prize winning? 
Okay. I don't know. It's an ion trap. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they stopped an atom right in its tracks. Yes. Wouldn't that's move. what this does. Okay. That's what this does. Yeah. So. This uh, same site has a bunch of other really great photographs. Yeah, I like, exactly, exactly. I like the third place in equipment and facilities, the molecular beam epitaxy machine, <laughs> which is just like something from Mars. Yes. Well, Maybe it is from Mars. <laughs> Rich, what do you have? Uh, what do I have? Oh yeah. Uh, I just, I had in my notes for, uh, twiv picks to address the relationship. Oh, 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 oh. sorry. To relax, uh, address the relationship between relative humidity and dew point. Cause this <laughs> is on the, uh, weather arc. And, uh, I found this video, which is not at all sophisticated in its production, but is very, very clear that basically yes. makes the point that your comfort level has a lot more to do with dew point than relative humidity. <laughs> right, right. Okay? Uh, and that you can, uh, when uh, relative humidity is uh, how much water is in the air and dew point is the temperature at which uh, the relative humidity is 100%. And it, in the conclusion, it makes the point that you can have 100% humidity and it's 55 degrees outside. Uh, so the dew point is 55 and you'll feel a lot more comfortable than if it's uh, 90 degrees and 50% humidity because at the higher temperature, there's more water in the air, even at 50% humidity. And that's why you feel uncomfortable. So check it out. All right. You, you can also no. calculate the approximate uh, altitude of, of cloud bases given the, uh, um, oh, the temp right. temperature and dew point. I was wondering why dew point was – pilots are always – Upset uh, yes. with dew point, and I was wondering why that was. <laughs> when the temperature dew point spread is smaller, the clouds are going to be lower. Hmm. As in cool. today's weather. <laughs> yes, so so today there might be a temperature dew point spread of, I don't know, 6 degrees Celsius or something, and that would suggest to me that the clouds are going to be in the 3,000 foot or so range. Right. Hmm. Dixon, what do you have? Well, again, I appeal to our optic lobes. Um this is the Underwater Photographer of the Year contest winners. Uh, I got this reference off of uh, a, a reference to the Atlantic Monthly, which published uh, an excerpt from that. But if you click on this, there are some absolutely stunning photographs. They're just amazing. And of various kinds, too. Not just uh, the kind that are unposed and just captured the moment, but also um, underwater structures like downed, um, uh, aircraft from World War II and a, a ship that was sunk intact and it looks as though it could float tomorrow um, and, and a breaching whale of course and lots of other things too. I was just very the quality of the photography here is just uh, astounding. Yes. I've seen it a, is pretty cool. I've seen a bunch of these whale ones on Instagram. I follow some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some whale, and the, right, these have right. been there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that that's, humpback coming out was on it's amazing. beautiful. Spy hopping, it's called. Why is it called spy hopping? Because it's looking around. It's actually checking out the environment. Is above it? Above the water's level, yeah. They can see things? Oh, sure. Really? Killer whales do that all the time. Wow. All the time. These are and this really is underwater cool. photography is incredibly hard. <laughs> exactly <laughs> right. I mean- I, I was I could spend hours and I did spend hours looking at these. They're they're just quite beautiful. Quite cool. beautiful. They're great. Nice. Kathy. I picked a paper that I just found out about yesterday because the faculty member in our department who's the senior author, Yasmina Lauer, sent it out. And uh, another faculty member from Michigan who I teach with, Beth Moore, is on the paper. And the gist of it is that CD45.1 and CD45.2 mice might not be functionally equivalent depending on how they've been bred and where you got them. And so the story is that they started – so these mice are used a lot by immunologists when they want to do transplants of, say, bone marrow from one mouse to another that has gotten you know a variety of different treatments. If they use these – uh, mice that are isogenic, in other words, they have all the same genome except for their CD45, where the CD, CD45.1 has one allele and CD45.2 has another allele, and you can distinguish those. Um, so they're really important mice. And what they found in Yasmina's lab was that there was a difference in infectivity by influenza and cytomegalovirus 
And when they looked at 45.1 and 45.2 mice, and this was totally unexpected. And so this ends up being a um, cutting edge paper in Journal of Immunology. And what they found out in the end is that there's a point mutation in a particular gene in the CD45.1 mice. And that gene, uh, that point mutation uh, results in a loss of expression of a protein called NCR1, and that changes uh, the immunological response. And when did this come about? Well, it turns out that the CD45.1 and 0.2 mice have been bred here at Michigan since 2009. And what they can't really tell is whether the mice in 2009, uh, the 45.1 mice in 2009, had the point mutation or not because mm. shortly after that they were bred back to some b6 mice and if they had the mutation that would have corrected it but um if you have mice from michigan um that were bred in-house during that stretch of time or if mutation was in the jacks mice and you've been breeding them ever since 2009 it might be something that you need to consider and if the also, the bottom line is if you got the 45.1 and 45.2 mice now from JAX, that's not an issue. But it is interesting that a single point mutation could result in this very different mm. phenotype. It only takes one. Huh. Yep. One, one amino acid made the difference in the defective interfering flu RNAs, too. I know. When you were saying that, I was thinking <laughs> about this pick that I had coming up. Wow. You got to be careful with everything. Mm -hmm. I have two picks. Um, <clears throat> one is an article in uh, The Scientist, which talks about how, you know, Trump gets to propose a budget and then uh, Congress yeah. pretty much ignores that and does their own thing. But, you know, this one slashes the budget for EPA and CDC, NIH, NSF is flat, FDA and ASA get increases. And, and so this really reflects simply the... Um, uh, the lack of appreciation and uh, ignorance of science by this president, I think, to want to decrease CDC and EPA in particular, because uh, that, of course, fits with his agenda. Yeah, yeah, it's the middle of a of a terrible flu season. Why not cut the CDC budget? Yeah, makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. And the other is an interesting article. It's actually an interview uh, with Jason Kotke, who is a well known um, writer and blogger. And this is, um, uh, if you've ever read any of his work, kotke.org, it's really very nice. Um, he, he's one of the original bloggers who made blogging um, very popular. And this is a interview with him where he's, you know, he thinks the, the blog is dead um, because it's all been taken over by, you know, Twitter and Facebook. And I have a nice quote to uh, summarize this article. One of the compelling things about blogs for me, this is Jason talking, was that you had individual people presenting links and information that were a little view into what that person was interested in and what was interesting about this person. As the blogs got bigger, things like Gawker and Engadget and all those sorts of blogs took off. Commercial blogs with teams of people doing it, it wasn't so much an individual thing anymore. I like the personal curation and filtering and where you find that these days, for better or worse, is Twitter and Facebook. And that really is a great summary of what's happened to blogging, yes. you know, these blogs, commercial blogs, they had to throw out, you know, 10, 20, 30 posts a day and see which one was sticky and would work. It's ridiculous. You know, a person like Kotke would write an article a day, you know, and think about it and do careful writing. And that's wonderful. And it's really sad that, you know, we're moving away from that. But I did want to say that, at least in science, there are still a lot of good blogs out there. And and what what's interesting is that these are kind of invisible to the rest of the world, so, you know, science, especially um, scientists who are blogging. The rest of the world doesn't see it. I got an email from a podcaster. It's a similar thing with podcasting. An email from a, a podcaster, Virginia Campbell, who has had for a long time the Brain Science Podcast, which is very popular. And um, she said that science podcasting is pretty much invisible to to uh, major media they have no idea that it exists or that they don't even care about it and i think it's the same with science blogging you know sure for some reason it's just invisible which is too bad because there's good stuff out there um for the reasons that jason points out and uh, we have a listener pick from jess 
who wants to submit a pick in, in, of the week in honor of Black History Month. Uh, and this is at visionlearning.com. Louis Tompkins writes, surgeon, scientist, and civil rights activist um, in Harlem, New York City, a long time ago. The career of Louis Tompkins Wright, who's linking back to episode 478, was involved in refining, updating the smallpox vaccine administration, among other things. He was an accomplished scientist and medical professional, as well as staunch civil rights activist. Sadly, I had to do some digging to learn about his amazing life and career, but maybe this pick will help shine a light on a great mind and contributor to science, medicine, and civil rights. Thinking about representation in science slash STEM, the database of female virologists may want to also include some option for other types of diversity as well. If not already, maybe it can be an additional tab for people who want to be identified in those other ways. Intersectionality. Yay, Kim Crenshaw and Paulie Murray. Thanks, Jess. So thank you, Jess. Lewis Wright, by the way, uh, was born in 1891 and <laughs> died in 1952. So it was a while ago. Wow. Yeah. That'll do it for TWIV 481. Please send us your questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. You can find us on any reputable podcast player. All you have to do is search for TWIV or This Week in Virology. Subscribe, please. And if you like what we do, please. Help us out, microbe.tv slash contribute. You can find Dixon de Pommier at the Fulton Fish Market every morning at 4 a.m. <laughs> where he is searching for Good food for his <laughs> restaurant. Wouldn't that be great? You think that would be great? Oh, you know, I would love that if I could only cook better. Well, thank I you, Dixon. Cook. You can be you can find him at uh, livingriver.org, which is a really cool fish site. Thank you. It's beautiful. Thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, That's not a fishing site. No. It's fish. Fish is very nice. It's about yes. fish. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This is a lot of fun. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor from the University of Florida in Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Speaking of blogging, you can find Alan Dove at turbidplaque.com. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Alan's also on Twitter, alandove.com. No, that Twitter doesn't have a .com. Alan Dove. <laughs> <laughs> on Twitter. On Twitter. I'm Vincent Racaniello, virology.ws. I want to thank ASM for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the introductory music. He's at ronaldjenkins.com. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.